What is up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. Things are probably going to be a little bit echoey today. My rugs were absolutely demolished by my children and my animals with all of the mud and pollen here and I needed them cleaned so I could even stand to be in here. So now they're just not in here for the moment and it's incredibly echoey, but they will be back before the next time that I film. So today I'm going to be speaking to you guys about an insanely fascinating case. Like from every single angle, this is just so interesting to me. There's so much psychology involved. Um, it was in a very different time in the forties and just things were so different. Technology was different forensics wise. And so it's honestly one that I could probably talk about for absolutely forever. Um, and it's even more interesting because it's one of the most sensationalized crimes in Canadian history, but you don't see many people talk about it anymore. And I know from the title, many of you guys are probably like, wait, Evelyn Dick, John Dick, the torso murder, like that sounds different from what I know. And this isn't the same situation from Cleveland back in the 30s, the series of murders, the serial killer. Um, this is actually something that is entirely different. So essentially, a man named John Dick, 40 years old, was murdered in March of 1946. And it ended up spiraling into this huge finger pointing, confusing mess and ended with no questions answered and essentially no justice at all for John Dick and his family. But it also brought to light a lot of very interesting things. For example, that beautiful women are capable of terrible, terrible things, um, which was very revolutionary at the time. It was just like, mind blowing back in the forties. And to this day, the case is widely controversial in Canada. And just to those that know it, there's a lot of people that are very divided when it comes to believing who killed John Dick, what exactly happened. And there was even this really creepy schoolyard song that was created out of his murder, um, which I will not repeat the lyrics to, but it was like a huge piece of Canadian history. And I wanted to share it with you guys today. Plus, his great niece actually is a subscriber of this channel and I thought that was absolutely insane. But before I get into the details, I want to thank Hunt Killer for partnering with me on today's video. You guys, huge important thing right now, Mother's Day is coming up as a mother myself. I know that I have a wish list and you guys need to be adding Hunt a Killer to your Mother's Day wish list. And even if you aren't a mother, it may or may not be suggested by me that you gift your mother Hunt a Killer subscription and then ask if you can play with her. That's kind of like a win-win for everyone. And for those of you who aren't aware of what Hunt a Killer is, Hunt a Killer is an amazing and unique murder mystery subscription box. Yes, you heard me right. That's delivered to your door monthly. Hunt a Killer consists of seasons and all of the seasons are surrounding different unsolved murders that it is your job to crack. In this particular season, Julie Adler unearths the remains of an actress from the 30s in her family's theater and something that was once believed to just be a simple disappearance turned into a homicide investigation. Julie, however, is being pushed out of the theater to protect its reputation by the board of directors and she basically is reaching out to you to ask for help. Each box contains pieces of evidence like documents, audio recordings, case files. There's even like little objects like pieces of clothing and other random things in there. So it's like legitimate evidence that you have to look into and you have to go through all of this to find clues and eventually the murderer. And it is not an easy task, you guys. It is not easy at all because you have different ciphers to decode. There's hidden messages and seemingly simple objects. Character list just keeps on building. It is such an elaborate story with so many different pieces to put into place. And it's awesome for just like this continuous party that you can have with your family. It's great for a date night at home. You can do monthly Zoom nights with friends. Like I said, this can be something that you do dedicated time with your mother, or you can just do it by yourself if you want to. Each box adds to the story and even better in my opinion, proceeds from each box are donated to the Cold Case Foundation, which is one of my favorites to support. Right now you can go to huntakiller.com forward slash Daniel Hallen and use code Hallen to get 20% off of your first box. Again, use code Hallen for 20% off of your first box. Thank you again to Hunt a Killer. And now onto the details of this like mind boggling case. If I'm being really honest, this case actually reminds me of Hunt a Killer. Like this seems like something that would be in this where people are just like desperately trying to find clues and this jumbled up mess that is confusing and makes absolutely no sense. So you guys are definitely gonna have to hang in there with me throughout this whole entire thing. I can't wait to see your opinions by the time I get to the end of it. So the two main 
people involved in this case are Evelyn McLean, who went on to be known as Evelyn Dick and John Dick. Now, Evelyn was born to Donald and Alexandra McLean on October 13th, 1920. So she would have just turned about 100 years old. She was born in Beamsville, Canada, but shortly after birth, her family decided to move to a home at 214 Roslyn Avenue in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which is where the rest of the story is going to take place. Her family actually moved to this area because her father, Donald, had been given a job at the Hamilton Street Railway as a streetcar conductor, and this was a great move for them. It was going to provide them with a good amount of money. It was nothing that was necessarily like the highest level job by any means, which does in fact come into play later on but it paid the bills. Donald eventually was able to work his way up in the company, but still nothing that was very high ranking, but he did at least make it to a pretty trusted position where he was in charge or at least able to handle the money that was paid for fare, which again comes into play later on. However, the simple life of, you know, she's born, she's an only child to these two parents that are just working their way through life like everyone else, Things were not that simple for the McLean family. Alexandra really, really, really wanted to live a lavish lifestyle, as did Donald, but they couldn't quite seem to make their way up the corporate ladder the way that they wanted to. It was very common in this time frame as well for mothers to basically stay at home. That's all they did. Um, they did not get jobs. And so he was kind of stuck in this company working for the railway and couldn't move any higher. And this led to a bunch of really bad habits. Donald ended up drinking pretty heavily most of the time and Alexandra had really bad anger issues. And as you can imagine, obviously this led to very questionable parenting when it came to Evelyn. Evelyn just seemed to be in the middle of this greed filled drinking rage storm of chaos and was basically forced by her parents to be whoever they wanted her to be and to do whatever they wanted her to do. And they would just constantly fight and you can imagine the kind of emotional trauma that would do to a child. Despite not being from an up and coming family at all in Hamilton, Canada, or just in the neighborhood in general, Donald and Alexandra wanted to make sure that Evelyn in some way still kind of came off as this wealthy higher class young girl from a well-to-do family. Their end goal was basically to use Evelyn to climb this social ladder. They realized that they were kind of stuck in it and weren't getting any further. So they were gonna to try to see if Evelyn could help them along the way. So because of this, Evelyn had a lot of very strict rules in place when she was growing up. She was not allowed to play with or hang out with any of the children in her neighborhood because they were in like a more lower class neighborhood and her parents did not want her to be commingling with these people because they saw them as lesser. She was, uh, eventually pulled out of the local public school because at the time, if you were anyone at all, you were sending your child to a private school because you could afford it. And that is eventually exactly what happened. She was somehow put into Loretto Academy, which was a private Catholic school just for girls. And it was well known that school in particular because pretty much only the elite could afford this tuition. It was like the top of the top when it came to private schools. So this kind of threw people for a loop because the McLean family definitely put on this front. And I don't know how many people saw through it at the time, but everyone knew that he worked for, you know, the railway station. Everyone knew that he was just like a streetcar conductor and that they didn't have a lot of money. So people were kind of scratching their heads when somehow Evelyn was able to get into this private school. This still didn't end up working out the way that Alexandra and Donald wanted. Despite Evelyn's attempts, desperate attempts at that, at fitting in with the different individuals that were around her in the school, she was coming up short, at least according to her mother. The older Evelyn got, the more beautiful she became, and Alexandra unfortunately saw this as kind of like the last attempt at their goal of being this wealthy, well-known family in Hamilton. Evelyn was basically forced to befriend older men. And she's a teenager at this point. She, you know, was still attending this private girls' school. And her mother's like, look, you're beautiful. Use that to your advantage. Go out there, make friends with these well to do men, and 
you'll be given all sorts of gifts and you'll be able to make all of these different contacts that can help us. And that is pretty much exactly what happened. Evelyn was given tons of gifts from furs to diamonds. Sometimes she would just be given money. And just as expected because of this, because Evelyn was seen with these very prestigious men, the McLean family started to become more well known and more just kept on adding on. Evelyn was getting more furs, money was trickling down from all of these men and she was able to then give it to her family. So they all were just covered in diamonds and furs and they were able to throw extravagant parties at some of the most fabulous hotels in the area and they would be able to take these different families out for the night on the town you know, and would basically pay for everything for them, let them live like the time of their life. And, and in their eyes, they were just living the absolute dream. I'm telling you, this like feels like it's something out of like Peaky Blinders or like something along those lines. But rumors were spinning at the time around all of this because people had already kind of questioned how Evelyn was able to get into this private school, but now all of a sudden there's just like all of this money in the family and he hasn't changed jobs. And many people had started to notice that Evelyn was seen with a ton of different older men, all different ones from wealthy husbands to um, politicians, lawyers, doctors, and the list went on. She would show up at local racetracks frequently with a new man every time. And a lot of people were just kind of raising their eyebrows and creating their own assumptions. And it kind of got worse because people started to question Donald's work as a conductor because while all of this is going on, and obviously Evelyn was getting money from a lot of these men that she was seen with, she was also seen spending a lot of nickels. And at the time, nickels, that was like the exact fare for a streetcar ride. So this is kind of where a big rumor that again comes into play later started to come to light. But society just kept on questioning Evelyn even more because she gave birth to her first daughter named Heather in 1942 at I believe like 22 years old. Now, Evelyn was not married, at least that everyone in the community knew, and having a child out of wedlock was very, very frowned upon, especially when you are coming from one of these well-known families. And they knew that this was something that basically they couldn't afford to deal with. This would basically have them shunned from the community. So Evelyn ended up telling everyone that she was not having a child out of wedlock and she was married. Her husband was just overseas. So everyone that asked questions heard this elaborate story about a man named Mr. Smith that Evelyn had married. So she was now going by Evelyn Smith and he was in the military and he had been overseas and just wasn't there for the birth and all of this. It was a very plausible story to everyone, but of course still had people scratching their heads because during all of this time, she was still seen in public with various men, but ultimately everyone shrugged it off. Shortly after this, Evelyn ended up pregnant with her second child, which unfortunately did end in a stillbirth. And then in 1944, two years after her daughter was born, she was pregnant for the third time and gave birth to a little boy named Peter. However, this pregnancy also raised a lot of questions. When Evelyn returned home from the hospital, which is where she said she was at, she did not return home with Peter. And a lot of people were obviously worried uh, making sure nothing was wrong. She had had a stillbirth before that, but Evelyn said that it had nothing to do with that, that Peter was born a completely healthy child. She could not afford to take care of two children at the time. So she decided to hand Peter over to the Children's Aid Society for adoption. So basically they were just kind of like the drama in a reality TV show from what it's sounding like. There, you know, there are so many different moving parts. Their whole life isn't making a lot of sense. There are just really bizarre things happening in their family. Um, but at this point, some things began to crumble because they were high enough in society to where they had a decent flow of money again from all of these men that Evelyn was involved with and um, other things that I will get into later. And Alexandra and Donald had had enough of each other. They had spent years and years fighting and now they were comfortable enough to decide that it was time to end their marriage. So in June of 1945, Evelyn and her mother Alexandra, along with Heather, moved into an apartment together and moved away from Donald. And almost immediately more 
the strange things started happening and everything went awry. So Evelyn, because she no longer lived with her father, she would frequently visit the railway station to see him and bring Heather to see him. And she ended up meeting 40-year-old John Dick somewhere along the way. John was born on May 25th, 1906 in Russia. And in 1924, he actually ended up in Canada after fleeing with his parents. And then finally, by the 40s, he settled down on his own in Hamilton. Pretty much right away, he got a job at Hamilton streetcar railway as a driver so essentially he'd only been working there for a couple of years but he was hanging out around Evelyn's father like they were all in the same area so this is how they ended up meeting each other now while working there John took notice of Evelyn because of the same reasons most men did because she was beautiful um, she had a very captivating demeanor this just blew him away and her story that she told him just made him want to be there for her that much more so Evelyn had told everyone that she was married to Mr. White who was in the military overseas and while overseas somehow got her pregnant three times and she went and told John that she was actually a widow. Now, she said that sometime during all of this, Mr. White actually died while in war and that she was now parenting alone. And so John was kind of the type of person that wanted to swoop in and help her out and do the best he could. So that's kind of how their relationship grew. Every time she'd come in, you know, they would flirt and talk to each other and he would always have little special gifts for not just Evelyn, but also Heather. And after only about a month or so of them knowing each other and without anyone including Evelyn's parents knowing that they were having this kind of secret relationship they decided to get married this shocked Alexandra for a few reasons because Evelyn just walked into the apartment one day and said hey by the way I'm getting married to this 40 year old man named John Dick that I've known for a month now first of all this was upsetting for Alexandra because she was aware of the kind of money that people at the railway station made because she had been married to a man that worked there and she didn't want Evelyn to settle down with someone like this because it wasn't going to help achieve their goals of being rich forever and having this crazy lavish life but also because Alexandra was under the impression that Evelyn was in a very serious relationship with a man named Bill Behozik. So Bill had been in Evelyn's life for a pretty long time. I don't know an exact time frame. Again, this is like a very long time ago, so there's not a whole lot on it. Bill was a pretty large part of her life and had been for years from my understanding. He would come to their home frequently to see Evelyn. He was familiar with Donald. He was familiar with Alexandra and Heather. Um, he had pretty much watched most of her life experiences the past handful of years. And they had actually just been together like less than a week prior to this news that she was getting married to this other man. Now it is theorized uh, that the only reason Evelyn wanted to marry John was because he was much older and she assumed that being older um, and the way that he carried himself, he had a lot more money than he actually did. She believed that he was making much more and that this would be like a more permanent situation for her and her family. Now, I don't know if that is true, obviously, and no one is here to speak for themselves anymore, but based off of her patterns, this is what is believed. Alexandra and Donald were so infuriated over this decision because of, from my understanding, these very absurd reasons of him not having enough money. Uh, so they actually were so mad about it, they did not go to their wedding. They outright refused. So on October 4th, 1945, without Evelyn's parents being present, John and Evelyn were married, but as I'm sure you can assume, things were still very strange. So after their marriage, Obviously, people do things very differently, and I totally respect that, um, but something that is typically expected when people get married is that they move in together. They, you know, start their life, they live in the same home, and Evelyn, for some reason, refused 
to move in with John. And this caused a lot of issues, obviously, between their marriage because she said that she didn't want to move in with him. Um, and then when he said that he would just move in with her just because he wanted to be with her, she said that they wouldn't all fit in the apartment that she was living at with her mom. It is theorized that she was so difficult about this and moving in with him for a handful of reasons. I've seen people say that they believe that she didn't want to move in with him because she knew she was not going to be with him for long or that he was going to be around for very long. I have seen that she likely wanted to not move in with him so that she could continue her relationship with Bill Bohozik and other men. I've also seen that she realized by this point that he just didn't have a lot of money. Um, and to me, that seems very plausible. Maybe she expected him to buy her some big, huge house and then he couldn't, so she was angry. But whatever reason it was, about a month later, they did in fact end up moving in together. But interestingly enough, Evelyn had her own terms if that was going to happen. Evelyn used her own money to purchase a home on Carrick Avenue in Hamilton, and she refused to have John's name on the house, which was not very common at the time. And she also refused to let him put any money down for the down payments. So again, people are just over there trying to figure out what exactly was going on. As I've already stated a million times, things are very different now. Back then, that was something that like you typically didn't see. And if you were hoping that things from this point on would get better in their marriage, that's not at all what happened. Things took a pretty bad turn very quickly. Almost immediately moving in together, it became clear that Evelyn had not stopped um, all of her relationships with other men. According to her mother, the entire time, that whole month that she wasn't living with uh, John, she was still involved heavily with Bill Bohozik. She was also seen with a handful of other men um, at other times. And, you know, while John was working, when they moved in together, she was still seeing men and he was devastated by this. On top of that, she just repeatedly took blows to his job. She said that his job wasn't good enough. She told him that the money he made wasn't good enough. Um, and she just complained and complained and just would not stop seeing other men. After about three months of this, it became so toxic that John decided the best choice was just to move out. Now, I don't know if she kicked him out or if it was solely his choice to move out, but it was not a healthy situation and he couldn't get her to cooperate and be what he considered a proper wife to be. So he decided to move in with his cousin, Alex Kammerer, who lived on 215 Gertrude Street, which was still local in Hamilton. Now, at this point, it was very obvious that Evelyn uh, clearly did not have very much interest in their marriage anymore, or probably never really had an interest in it at all. It was very clear that she just assumed there was money connected to him, and when it wasn't, she immediately was just irritated with that. However, John very badly wanted for their marriage to work. He was seeing things a very different way, so he attempted to speak to Donald in hopes that Donald could get his daughter under control, convince her to stop seeing other men and be a better wife to John, which is what she said she would do when they married each other. Donald, however, as we know, was not very fond of John. Neither was Alexandra. They wouldn't even go to their marriage. So Donald didn't really care too much about this. Things did not go as planned. Donald was not interested at all in helping this, you know, his daughter be a better wife to this man that he didn't approve of. Um, so John basically brought out the very last tactic that he had. John told Donald that he knew the only reason the McLeans were as well off as they were and were able to do things like send Evelyn to a private school was because he had spent years pulling nickels used for streetcar fare out of the box because that is the position he was in where he could have access to that in order to support his lifestyle. And that this is something that he had been doing for years at this point. And... Basically, John was holding this against him and was like, if you don't help me get Evelyn to calm down and stop seeing other men and act like a proper wife, then I am going to tell your secret. However, John was not prepared for the kind of reaction that he got. Donald basically immediately threatened to kill him. Like no hesitation, no willingness to compromise, just immediately was like, I will kill you if you say anything about this to anybody. And 
I have seen in other sources that John didn't figure this out on his own or from rumors, but that Evelyn actually trusted him with the secret. Now, according to what I'm seeing about the relationship, I don't know if it's just kind of exaggerated that this was all just for money or if there was a part of her that maybe was interested in him and then for some reason she realized she was just in love with Bill. Because this is so old, I just, I don't know. But if it really was all for money, I don't really see her trusting him with this sort of information. So I don't know how this came about, but Donald was angry about it. And it was enough to scare John to going to the police. Now, unfortunately, the police didn't do much of anything when he said that he had been threatened. Um, he probably didn't want to say why he had been threatened because blackmailing is not legal and... Um, it would then be telling authorities that Donald had been stealing money, which would definitely get him killed. So I that's probably why authorities didn't take it very seriously. But shortly after this, John was in fact found dead. On Saturday, March 16th, 1946, so at this point, John and Evelyn had only been married for six months. A few kids were playing in an area in Hamilton that was known as the Mountain. Um, that is what it was referred to as. And they spotted something that they originally believed to be a headless pig. Um, and being kids, they were obviously very curious about this. So they went closer and upon further examination, they realized that this was not a headless pig, but it was just the torso of a human. So they immediately ran to report their discovery to police. Authorities arrived and noticed that this was in fact the torso of a male, um, that the arms had been very visibly and obviously sawed off, the same with the legs and the head. They were also able to see that someone had, whoever done this, had tried to saw the torso in half as well and just was not successful. They searched the entire area as thoroughly as they could and they couldn't find any of the other extremities at all. Authorities had found his torso on something called an escarpment, which is basically made from erosion and creates this sort of cliff-like area. And the torso was kind of tucked up underneath this location, so it appeared it had been purposely hidden there. So it wasn't like the torso and the rest of these remains had been thrown out of a vehicle. Authorities believed also, based on different skid marks in the dirt, as well as some broken branches and obviously disturbed leaves, someone had tried to carry or drag the torso about 30 to 40 feet from the road. So this was something that had been planned and it was put here specifically to basically hide it. So rumors of these remains, because they had not been identified and authorities did not have a lot to go off of, keep in mind, there's just not as many advanced forensic techniques back in the 40s. So they were pretty much relying on someone to be like, hey, I think this may be someone that I know. Authorities were contacted by city employees that had actually found a bloody shirt in the area on March 7th. The shirt was pinstriped, it had bullet holes all over it, covered in blood, and it was found actually near Mountain Boulevard, which is near the escarpment. And they noticed when they looked at it that the shirt was mainly bloody around the neck and that the arms of the shirt had either been cut or turn, torn off. And the shirt itself was actually still buttoned, indicating that it had likely been pulled off of the body. But they originally left it and didn't think much of it until they heard about this torso and they decided to go ahead and call this information in. And the shirt was actually a huge way that they were able to help identify the body. Behind the scenes, there was actually a lot going on in regards to John and people that cared about him had already noticed that he was missing. The last day that John was seen was on Monday, March the 4th. He was getting off of a streetcar at about 10 a.m. on Sanford Avenue and King Street, and he had gone to the inspector's office at the railway station, and he asked if he could leave all of his equipment there while he went out because his shift didn't start until about 4 p.m. that day. The inspector said that he left at around 12.15 p.m. All of John's belongings were still there, but by 2 p.m. the items were gone, and the hat that John had been wearing earlier was now left on the desk. However, John never showed up for a shift that was supposed to last from 4 p.m. to midnight. And also, he never showed up at home that night, but I'll get more into that in a minute. 
The following day at work, everyone was concerned about him, and this would have been the fifth. And he showed up saying that he was just sick the day before, and now he was willing to work. But then the next day, the sixth, which was a Wednesday, he didn't show up for work again, and then again on Thursday, the 7th of March. Now, at this point, Mr. Castle, who was John's boss, thought this was very strange, and he was also concerned because John had $75 worth of company money on him. Not just that, he had been working for the company for years now, and this was never something that had happened before. So he decided to approach Donald, who also happened to work under Mr. Castle. He was asking if John still lived with Evelyn and was asking where he was, and for some reason, Donald just wouldn't answer. The following week, Mr. Castle was out of town, but he couldn't stop thinking about John and how out of character this was. So on March 14th, he decided to write a letter to a friend named Mr. Branch. And Mr. Branch had land that was beside John's family's land, and he was trying to see if he could figure anything out, maybe see where John was because he wasn't getting answers from Evelyn's family and was very concerned. By the following day, March 15th, Mr. Castle decided to go ahead and report John as missing. Now, authorities were trying to talk him into getting a warrant because John did have company money at the time. Mr. Castle didn't want to, but figured maybe if he did, that would involve more police and they'd be able to find John. But then something strange happened that actually led family to come forward to authorities to try to identify the torso. So John actually had two sisters, Anna and Lena, and they were married to two brothers named David and Jacob. And all of them lived on the same property in Beamsville. They were fruit farmers. There was another family member that had a canning factory. And apparently on March 17th, two days after the torso was found, Evelyn called them. And I guess this wasn't something normal that she did. And what she said was even more strange. First of all, she demanded to know where John was and then began to say that he owed $500 to people and he was supposed to appear in court for it and had never showed up the week prior. She also informed him that John was being searched for because he had ran off with company money and that she was being forced to pay this and didn't want to because it essentially wasn't her problem. It seemed like she was trying to get money out of the brothers. So she started to say that John was supposed to sell all of his shares at the family's canning factory to pay back debts to all these people including her own mother Alexandra and when she was informed that John didn't even have any shares in the canning factory she became very upset and she started to ask if Maggie John's mother had shares that she could use to pay her off so it really did seem like she just wanted money so they ultimately decided to hang up on her and they immediately called the cameras to check in on John because that's where he was supposed to be living and they were trying to see what was going on and this is when they were informed by the cameras that John hadn't been home and well over a week and that there was a torso that was just found that they believed belonged to him. Now, the camera said that they expected John home the night of the 6th. He had actually called them, said, hey, do you mind picking me up some seafood from um, the local market? That's what I want to have tonight. And they left it out and ready for him. And he never ate it and never came home. And there was only one instance in the five weeks that he lived with them that he didn't come home one weekend, but he immediately called them to let them know about it. So this was very out of character. Immediately upon hearing this, both brothers ended up coming to help identify the body and they were able to do this through different markings on him and they also informed authorities while there that just two weeks prior they had seen John and this was at his grandmother's funeral and before he left he looked to everyone and said if you don't see me again you'll know who got me and her that this had been a very very brutal murder Um, John obviously as they could see had been fully dismembered um, and he had been killed by a 32 caliber gun. At the time, all authorities really had was that he had two gunshot wounds in his chest, but neither one of those would have killed him, so they believed that the real cause of death was likely that he was shot in the head. Hearing of the relationship struggles between Evelyn and John, authorities decided to go obviously straight to Evelyn and they wanted to question her in regards to her husband's death. And obviously also they had to break the news to her that they were pretty sure her husband's torso had been found after being dismembered. And they assumed that even despite their differences and the struggles in their marriage, that Evelyn would be distraught. And they were met with something entirely different than they were expecting. So upon being told that 
Her husband had been brutally murdered. Evelyn said, and I quote, don't look at me. I don't know anything about it. Now, this was shocking in itself, but what was even more shocking was when Evelyn said that she casually may have known who was responsible. I mean, went from like not being shocked that her husband was found dead, trying to immediately defend herself, and then went on to say, but I'm pretty sure I know who did do it. Evelyn began to tell a very elaborate story to authorities. She said that around the time that they believed John had been killed, a strange Italian man showed up to their family home. And at this point, again, John was not living there. And she said that this man knocked on the door, said he was looking for John, and he appeared angry. When she told this man, this Italian man, that John was not there. The man said that John had been messing around with his wife and that he was going to, and I quote, fix John for it. But that is all that happened. This man left afterwards. And this man, according to Evelyn, never gave a name. Um, she said that she personally didn't recognize this man at all. I don't know if she gave a description of him, but this obviously kind of sent authorities down their first path of, okay, the strange Italian man showed up and, you know, obviously a, a crime of passion here. There was potentially a lot of infidelity going on, just a whole bunch of things. So they're trying to figure this out, but something also just wasn't quite sitting right with authorities because of the way that Evelyn reacted. So they decided to continue to look into Evelyn as a possibility um, when it comes to involvement in John's murder. Um, and they were going to do that while they were looking into other, other things. And they actually uncovered a bunch of very interesting pieces of information in regards to Evelyn. Authorities spoke to many people that knew of Evelyn and many people that knew of John and their marriage. And this ended up leading them to an older man named Bill. And this is not the same Bill as Bill Bohosik that she was in a relationship with. This is a completely different Bill. And he said that Evelyn had recently borrowed his car, and when he got it back, he was horrified at the shape it was in. Most of the time when she would borrow his car, she returned it perfectly fine. However, right around the time that John was murdered, I am unsure if it was on March 6th exactly, or you know, even the day afterwards, um, she returned it in really bad shape. According to Bill, the seat covers from the car were entirely missing, like seat covers totally stripped off, gone. The front seats uh, that I'm assuming didn't have seat covers on them were covered in blood. He found bloody clothing in the back of the car and I'm assuming the trunk area. And the whole thing was just bloody and disturbing. Evelyn had left a note for Bill with the car when she returned it. So she didn't even like stay to explain this to him. She just left a note. Now, according to the note, the car was such a mess because Heather, Evelyn's daughter, had accidentally cut herself and that's the explanation for why there was so much blood. But according to Bill, it seemed like a lot of blood for just an accidental cut. Bill very willingly handed over his car to authorities to take for testing. And as I've stated, DNA testing at the time did not exist, forensic testing, was very, very basic. So the most that they could really do with it was check the blood for the blood type because that could at least narrow down if it was the same blood type as John. Pathologist William Deadman took blood samples from the car and found that the blood was type O. And despite Evelyn's claim that all of this blood came from a cut from her daughter, Heather, Heather did not have type O blood but John did. Authorities brought Evelyn back in to confront her about all of this because they knew at this point, hey, you borrowed a car around the time of your husband's murder. It was returned covered in blood. You said it was your daughter's blood, but it doesn't match your daughter's blood type. Um, you know, what on earth is going on? And I think they genuinely expected her to crack at this point, but instead she just changed her story, this time to include this guy's car. So Evelyn said that she used Heather's cut as a way to basically keep Bill from panicking over what had really happened. And that, you know, she basically admitted the story about Heather cutting herself was entirely made up, but she didn't do anything wrong. The story Evelyn went on to tell was entirely different from the first one. 
Evelyn said that no Italian man showed up to her house, but instead she got a call one night around the time of John's murder, um, an anonymous call from a male. Now this male told her that John had gotten his wife pregnant and that he was going to kill John for it. In this phone call, the man told Evelyn to meet him at a certain location with a car um, so that he could borrow it. And I'm assuming he likely threatened her to do this according to her story. So she got to this certain location that she was told to go to and was met by another strange man she didn't recognize who was holding up a bag. And he said that parts of John were inside the bag and basically forced her to drive him to dispose of the rest of the body. Now, Evelyn seemed very, very sure of this story, and she even told police that she could show them the route that she took that night with this man. So they're like, all right, sure, this sounds plausible. Like, if this person threatened you into helping dispose of the body, you know, that does explain the car. We can make this all make sense. So they put her in the car, and they were really kind of expecting to see some form of emotion during this because she was reliving what would have been a very traumatic experience in her life, and... Um, you know, they couldn't imagine what that must have been like to be driving this strange man who's already killed your husband. You know, you have no idea if he's going to kill you and your husband is now dead in the back of the car that you're driving. And so they asked her, you know, how, how did that feel? Like, how are you doing? And the only thing that she said was, it's a pretty mean trick to break up a home. And this was, from my understanding, directed at John in regards to getting this woman pregnant. So she wasn't, again, necessarily worried about John or what happened to him or what this person did. She basically was saying he was deserving of what happened to him because of his actions. So this threw authorities off all over again. And when they were trying to question her, just like with the Italian man about what this guy looked like, um, what all was going on, I don't believe she was ever able to give a good description of him. She still didn't have a name. So now authorities are yet again looking for a second anonymous man while still keeping a close eye on Evelyn because of her odd behavior. And authorities feeling that something was off with Evelyn was proven right for a third time because she ended up telling another version of events. So this time, Evelyn, and I don't know what exactly encouraged this. I know with the other time she had been confronted with information and... Um, that kind of forced her out into a new story, but I wasn't able to find if anything in particular really sparked her to do this. But she said that, you know, there was no strange Italian man that showed up to her house. That there was no anonymous caller, but that actually this was all a part of Bill Bohozik's plan. The man that she was seeing prior to marrying John, the one that her mom, uh, you know, knew that she was in a serious relationship with, the man that she continued to see after being married to John. So she essentially said that Bill was jealous of John. He did not want John to be married to her. He wanted to marry Evelyn himself. And because of this, he hired an Italian man to kill him. Evelyn said that Bill had confessed all of this to her, that this was all of his doing, and basically every single detail of John's murder. And so for the second time, she took authorities on like an entire tour of Hamilton, pointing out all of these different places that John had been taken, you know, where different body parts had been put. She was able to explain exactly how he was dismembered, where he was dismembered. She knew all these things. And I mean like a whole other tour and keep in mind that she had already taken them on an entire drive around Hamilton before saying, oh yeah, this man forced me to drive here, here, and here. And now it's just like an entirely different story, totally different locations. And again, she still seemed very sure of what she was saying. So at this point, they have multiple stories from Evelyn. They have multiple locations. Um, she claimed this all happened at multiple anonymous men involved. We've got a handful of Italian men. They're not sure if the first Italian man had anything to do with the third Italian man. And it was just a roller coaster for authorities. And it made it even more frustrating because like I said, these weren't just small, non-detailed, very vague versions of events. Like she was telling full on, fully detailed, I mean, just like 
novels to authorities about this. Obviously at this point, authorities believe that Evelyn was somehow connected to this murder in some way because she was sending them on a wild goose chase and it seemed like she was doing that to keep them off of her own trail. However, they also believed that maybe some of what she said was real. Because a lot of the time when people lie, there are truths that are in someone's lie. And if you can pick those out, you can usually start to form the real story because the truth is a lot easier to remember than a lie is. And that's why so many people that choose to lie about things add in small bits of truth to help them remember and keep them on track. So because they felt so strongly that Evelyn was possibly involved, they decided to go and search Evelyn and John's home to see if there were any clues at all as to what may have actually happened. And they ended up stumbling across something that they were not looking for, they were not expecting, and this just adds a whole other layer to this case that makes me so horrified of this woman. So in the attic, they were searching, obviously, and they found a suitcase. Now, I want to preface this real quick. I had already recorded this and wanted to go back and just kind of put in a trigger warning because... Obviously, my entire channel is a trigger warning. It is true crime. There are all sorts of things on here that can be very upsetting and unsettling to people, but this one um, particularly involves infant death, and I know that that can really badly bother a lot of individuals, so if this is something that you do not want to hear, absolutely now is the time to click away, um, and I'll put a timestamp for when we are past this. However, it will likely be mentioned again towards the end of the video. So while authorities were searching the attic, they did find the suitcase and it was locked and there was no key in sight and no one claimed to have a key. So they ended up having to basically pry this suitcase open and inside of the suitcase, they found a cardboard box. Now, this cardboard box was wrapped in a skirt that had Evelyn's name on it. Um, and inside of the box, it was filled with cement and there was a really bad odor. So they decided to take it to the local police station and have um, W. Deadman come and help them figure out what was inside of it. And they basically had to chisel away at it. And inside of the concrete was a bag, like a woman's bag. And the remains of an infant were inside of it. Um, and it was obviously like a, a brand newborn baby. Um, it was Evelyn's son, Peter, the same one that she claimed to put up for adoption when everyone asked why on earth she didn't show up back at home with him. Now, before going to Evelyn about what they found and because they, I think at this point they knew they were not going to get a truthful story that she was just going to add more bizarre layers on top of everything, they decided to go to her mother, Alexandra. And Alexandra was specifically questioned about Peter since, you know, obviously Peter was born while they were living together and maybe she had some sort of information on this. And I don't know if she fully knew the truth um, that Evelyn did get rid of Peter. I don't know, you know, what exactly happened, obviously, or if she was just trying to, you know, protect herself and pretend like she didn't but she did seem shocked by this information. She said that she had seen Donald at that particular suitcase recently. And I think she said it was just the day before and that she thought something was weird about it because she saw him like hovering over the suitcase. And when he noticed she was in the room, he turned around and told her to get the hell out, like yelled at her to get out. And she thought that was super strange. So, so again, I don't know if this is her trying to put any sort of blame off of herself and push it on everyone else. Um, or she really didn't have any idea what was going on, but she knew it was something that seemed off. So they were trying to now figure out this situation and how to handle this. And they also went on to search the rest of the home for more evidence and ended up finding bone fragments and teeth in the coal furnace of the home. So they collected all of this for evidence because at this point they still had not found his head or any of his limbs. So they were hoping this would maybe give them a little bit more insight. So Dr. William Dedman tested the bone fragments and teeth as well, again, with very limited forensic testing at the time, but was able to come to the conclusion that they all likely belong to John. And while I think that that could be debated, 
We also already know the bones that they're not going to find if it was somebody else, which would just bring up a whole other issue because not only are you finding an infant child dead in a suitcase in this woman's attic, but her husband's missing and found murdered and now you're finding other bones in her cold furnace. But they had very specific bones they were looking for, obviously, because they knew exactly what they were missing of his remains, and that is pretty much pieces of what they found. Because Alexandra claimed that Donald seemed to know at least about the contents of the suitcase and some of the things that Evelyn clearly had done, authorities decided to go ahead and search the McLean family home for evidence there of John's murder or just anything in general that could help out with this case and the fact that they found this dead infant. During their searches, they found so much. They ended up finding blood-stained shoes that they were able to confirm belonged to John. They found a gun matching the same caliber as the one believed to kill John. They also found numerous other guns and cartridges. They found saws also that were all hidden down in the basement. They found a pipe in the home that was just riddled with bullets that there was no other explanation for. So this information was kind of quietly taken and while finishing up their searches for more possible evidence, they decided to go ahead in the meantime and confront Evelyn about Peter. Evelyn hearing this information that, I mean, they're putting in front of this woman's face, like, look, we found the baby you claim to put up for adoption in a suitcase in your home. Like, clearly, you know, your child was not ever put up for adoption. Was it an accident? Did you kill him? Like, what is going on here? Like, if he did just accidentally die, why wouldn't you just say that? But yet again, just as they had expected, Evelyn changed her story the second she heard this new information. This time, she still maintained that Bill did in fact hire an Italian man to kill John, but also that for some reason, Bill himself also killed Peter. I don't know if she again said this was out of jealousy or what the situation was, um, but that is what she claimed. With the change of stories, and I'm talking like numerous, very large changes in her stories, along with mounting evidence, no other suspects to look at, all the other people that authorities had been directed to, were just anonymous males from these ever-changing stories. Authorities decided to go ahead and form a theory on what they believed happened, and they were able to find a motive for everyone they believed to be involved, which was Evelyn, Bill Bohosik, and Donald McLean. Authorities believed that Evelyn wanted her husband gone. He did not make the kind of money that she assumed he made, and this obviously did not sustain the lifestyle that she had in any way, shape, or form. So because of her pattern of just using men for their money, she likely realized she was now trapped in a marriage um, and he wasn't giving up and she needed to do something to get out of it. They also theorized that she wanted John dead because she realized she wanted to be with Bill Bohosik and he had more to offer her than John did. Now, Bill likely wanted John dead for pretty much the same reasons that Evelyn had claimed in all of her accusations against him, that he you know, was having a pretty serious relationship with her. I'm sure he was also shocked when John was found dead. Um, I don't know if they maybe planned that entire marriage together, hoping that they could then kill him and get his money, but then he didn't have any money. And so they're like, forget it. We just got to get out of this. Um, but he basically wanted to be with Evelyn. So he likely had no issue playing a part in this. And then when it comes to Donald, he likely also had many other reasons to want John dead. Donald obviously knew at this point, according to what was said, that John knew about his schemes and taking money from the railway station. And if this ever got out, it would ruin his life and his family's life, which again, just adds another reason that maybe Evelyn wanted to get rid of John because she didn't want to lose that lifestyle either. And on top of that, he had never approved of John marrying his daughter. Authorities believed that what they likely did uh, was borrow the car from Bill, again, not Bill Bohosik, but the older gentleman. And they did this because first of all, it was a very common thing for Evelyn to do and no one would think twice about it. And it also would put space between them and evidence from the actual murder. 
If authorities for some reason connected the dots and made their way back to Bill's car, it would be way more likely that they would try to pin it on this man. Again, there was just not a ton of advanced forensic testing at the time. So people kind of were charged all willy nilly to an extent. So they were hoping this would kind of create that separation. Also, Evelyn was really good at just kind of wooing her way through everything. She would just swoon people to her heart's content to get them to believe whatever she said and just fall in love with her. And she likely genuinely believed that he would never question this idea that her daughter got a cut in the car and that's why there was so much blood everywhere. Authorities thought that the ultimate goal was obviously to kill and dismember John so that they could get rid of his entire body. So again, just disposing of more evidence. So this is why they dismembered him to basically put him in smaller pieces so that they could successfully burn him in the coal furnace. And they believed that the only reason his torso was not done the same way is because of the evidence they found on it that it had been attempted to be sawed in half, but it was clearly too difficult. And so this kind of put them in this position where they cannot get rid of all of his body. They have this gigantic piece of evidence here that they need to get rid of. So they went and threw it just wherever they could in like a very unplanned way. And then they believe that all of the other evidence that was found in the home, like the bullets, maybe they had never thought about the holes, you know, leaving any evidence behind and all of those pipes. On top of that, you know, it was on top of that, it was very common for people to have that caliber of gun and saws in their home. And they probably just completely overlooked the situation with his shoes. They might've just forgotten that they left them there. Evelyn's stories were all different, but they all had the same idea to them. The first is that the finger was always pointed at John, that John had done something wrong. And every single time, again, the truth slipping out, Evelyn would basically sneak in ways of saying like, whatever happened, he deserved it. And like this very weird, way there was always an anonymous strange man she'd never seen or heard of coming to get him and then it's very common for people that are doing something wrong to blame another person for what they're actually doing it's projection so this constant thing that oh john was out there you know cheating he was out there with other women he was out there getting other people pregnant was really just her own projection of some of the things that she was doing in her life that everyone knew she was doing and what better way to throw authorities off of your trail than have authorities look for someone and or in this case multiple different anonymous men that likely just don't exist once the evidence was fully collected and all of the forensics were done, the theory was finally formed. Everything was kind of tied together with a bow. Evelyn, Donald McLean, Bill Behozik, all of them were arrested and charged with the murder of John Dick. This is where things really went wild. So photos of all of them obviously hit the papers very quick. And the photos of Evelyn and what she had done potentially to her husband, what she was being accused of, it reminds me a lot of people that fell in love. And I literally want to gag saying this. It reminds me of the people that fell in love with Ted Bundy. You know, they see this man that's capable of all these horrible things, but they're like, oh, wow, but he's so attractive. And this is essentially exactly what happened with Evelyn Dick. People saw this beautiful woman with this like smirk on her face and they were like mesmerized by her. And then when you pair that with this idea that she like possibly murdered her husband, people got weird very quickly. Because of the attention that she received, Evelyn was the first to go to trial in Wentworth County. Um, and her attorney, John Sullivan, actually planned things I guess smart, I guess you could say. I really don't want to use that term, but he basically used the attention that she was getting to his advantage. So his thought was that, well, he petitioned to have her trial separate from both Bill and Donald because he believed he could put her on stand, have her all done up and her beautiful outfit and all of her charm. And she would essentially be able to use her pretty face and talk her way out of what she was now in the middle of, which was a murder trial. And he was very certain that this would likely work. But the whole trial, you guys, just kept on taking absolutely insane turns and just repeatedly shocked the community. 
And I swear this was done on purpose to just still throw people off of what was actually happening and what they needed to be focusing on, which was the murder of John. So everyone was so fascinated in this case and how controversial it was. There, in all reality, was really no evidence that I know of, or at least not very solid evidence that specifically connected Evelyn to the murder of John. It was more so connected to her father and then only connected to Bill through her own accusations. But authorities maintained that they had plenty to show that she was at least involved and they pushed to keep on with the trial and basically for the worst possible punishment. The community was shocked even more when Alexandra, her own mother, was set to testify against her in return for immunity. There was just so much hype and so much chaos revolving around all of this before the trial even started. So the attorney's plan was already working exactly as he had hoped. But like I said, drama just kept on happening that took the reality of everything off of center stage. In the preliminary hearing against her, it was kind of pinned against her how promiscuous she was. That was one thing that the prosecution was really pushing on for multiple reasons, not just to do it and not just to necessarily make her feel bad or anything, but because she was involved with a lot of men. And they were like, there are how many men that could have wanted John dead? There are how many men that may have been jealous? You know, when it comes to your son, Peter, there were how many men that could have been his father? So the judge just in front of everyone blatantly asked Evelyn how many men that she had slept with. The judge then says, well, can you name all of them for me? Because we, if you know, if there's this possibility, there's 150 men out there that may have wanted John dead, we need to know their names. And the first thing she did was look to him and say, your son, first of all, you can see why this was such like a crazy trial. She was using all of her like sarcasm and charm, like everything that she had learned to manipulate people and her attorney was encouraging it. And it was just like absolutely mind blowing to everyone. Evelyn went on to name, like I stated previously in my video, so many different men, very prominent, well-known, wealthy men, doctors, attorneys. I mean, there were men sitting in the courtroom that she was just pointing to. I can only imagine how many well-known families after this were being outed and just destroyed because of these unfaithful husbands. It was like reality TV for the 40s. But as I've said at this point like 10 times, John got lost in all of this. People were no longer necessarily there for John and because they wanted justice for him, but because they were so fascinated with Evelyn and hearing the like offhand remarks that you just didn't hear women typically say and just living in this crazy lifestyle that she led. When things did finally send her back to John, Alexandra said that Evelyn had in fact been gone most of the day of March the 6th, essentially saying she would not provide an alibi for her daughter. And that was the day that John was murdered, just to refresh your mind. And she also specifically remembered asking Evelyn where John was just a few days later on March the 8th. And she said that she remembered Evelyn looking at her and saying, John will not be coming around anymore. And she thought that was a very strange thing to say because you know, even at this point, they were all used to John popping back in, trying to get their marriage to work out. And so for her to all of a sudden, two days after he's murdered, say, oh, he won't be coming back. You can see where this was obviously an issue, but I do want to note, I don't know how much coming from her mother's mouth that I trust because of their history that I've seen. By the end of this very long and sensationalized trial that has been the subject of numerous movies and documentaries, Evelyn was ultimately found guilty and was sentenced to death by hanging. John's family at this point felt like they could take a breath of fresh air because this evil woman that seemed to come in out of nowhere and within seven months totally destroy his life and take him from them, she was finally done. She was put away, she was sentenced to death. But Bill and Donald still had to wait for their trials. However, everyone was pretty sure after what happened with Evelyn that the same would be the case for Bill and Donald. But things changed pretty rapidly. Evelyn 
was not going down without a fight. So she decided to appeal and she also got a new attorney named JJ Robinette who, who swore to get her out of all of these legal troubles. Robinette argued that Evelyn's statements that had been taken from authorities after John's death had not been properly handed over to the court as evidence. And he also argued that there were issues within the jurors. I'm not exactly sure what those issues were. I can only imagine um, maybe there was someone that she had possibly slept with in that jury or possibly because it was so well known, someone in the jury was biased. I'm th I mean, the list could go on and on. There's no telling, but ultimately the court agreed and Evelyn's guilty verdict and death sentence were overturned and she was granted a new trial. And this absolutely flipped everybody out and ended up destroying essentially Donald and Bill's trial, but mainly Bill's. So Bill and Donald had not gone to trial yet. And this was done on purpose because they were hoping what would happen had that Evelyn would be found guilty and she would be sentenced to death. And so after that sentencing occurred, they wanted to put Bill and Donald on trial and then use Evelyn to hopefully speak out against these men to help strengthen their cases because either A, she would want them to be in there with her. So she would just at that point not care and would give everything over or she would want her sentencing to be lessened. So she would offer help. Because Evelyn had managed to appeal and her verdict and sentencing was overturned, she now had like absolutely no fear and she refused to testify at either trial. And for Bill's trial in particular, she was the prosecution's pretty much only witness, the main one and the only one. So now they didn't have anything to bring forward. This is the one thing they were holding on to because they had no evidence directly connecting him. They only had what Evelyn had said. And because of this, Bill was found not guilty and just released. Now, Donald, on the other hand, I know she did not testify at his trial either, but they still had a decent amount of evidence. A lot of that evidence, um, you know, the guns, the different weapons, the saws were found in his home. So they were able to keep pushing forward. And ultimately he was in fact found guilty, but he wasn't found guilty of his original charges, which was the murder of John Dick, but instead for accessory after the fact, and he was sentenced to five years in prison. By 1947, Evelyn was back up for trial again, and her attorney was still JJ Robinette and made basically a different plan this time around. So he was arguing at the preliminary hearing to see if the trial would move forward that Donald McLean was the only person involved that they knew they had nothing against Bill because, you know, he was obviously found not guilty and let go, that they clearly felt there wasn't enough to overturn Evelyn's original verdict and her sentencing, and that they even by luck alone were able to successfully get that verdict and um, sentencing to begin with with Evelyn because they didn't have a lot of direct evidence linking her to the crime. So they said the only evidence really pointed towards her father, Donald, and that Evelyn had absolutely nothing to do with it. They brought up the fact that there was a bunch of blackmailing involved, that they had proof that Donald had in fact threatened John. And so it was more than likely just him that acted alone. The defense strategies that he used in that particular moment made him famous essentially, because nothing like that had ever been done before. Um, it was just very intriguing strategies and it worked exactly how he hoped. And Evelyn was immediately found not guilty for the murder of John Dick and was set free, except authorities were not about to let her loose that fast because they knew what she was capable of. They knew what they had followed her through during their entire investigation. So they ended up instead, and I, I knew that they had likely waited for this when I saw this not added to her original charges, um, but they ended up charging her with manslaughter in regards to the death of her son, Peter. Despite the fact that Evelyn had pointed the finger at Bill in regards to her own son's death, there was absolutely no evidence yet again proving that Bill had anything to do with it other than Evelyn's claims. And the only person they could really go back to was her because the suitcase was in her attic. She was the one who told everyone she'd actually put him up for adoption when obviously that was not the reality. And a lot more information actually came out during the trial. So when they were asking Evelyn how this even came about, 
they were able to bring different doctors and pediatricians from the hospital and to testify. And many of them did see the baby boy completely healthy. Um, she had him on September the 4th. And then she was released from the hospital by September the 15th. And everyone witnessed her leaving the hospital with a perfectly healthy newborn baby. Now, according to Evelyn, she said that after this, she immediately went to meet Bill because Bill was actually the father of Peter. This is what she admitted at trial, despite not putting his name down on the birth certificate or anything like that. And she said that Bill basically didn't want to have ties to this illegitimate child, despite the fact that he wasn't tied to the child in any way, shape or form. And I guess she said that they met at a hotel and she just gave the baby to Bill, who said that he would take care of this child, didn't question it, didn't see the baby. And then that sometime later, like way further in time, Bill showed up with a box, this box that the baby was eventually found in. She said that the reason her skirt was wrapped around it was because the box was leaking cement, so she had to stop it from dripping everywhere. But from what I've seen in the transcripts, I don't see anything where she states that she knew that the baby was in there, so I don't know why that would have been something that she would have kept. Um, there's just a lot of missing holes. It's a bunch of accusations with her not having any explanation to go along with it. And they basically went the route of saying it was, you know, her mentality that she was mentally not where she should have been. Um, she was not in a space where she could have understood her actions or the repercussions of them. And they brought in a psychiatrist who ended up evaluating Evelyn and found that she had endured so much trauma as a child, which I don't doubt literally in the slightest based on everything that I've seen. Um, because, you know, her parents basically emotionally neglected her, forced her into being what they wanted her to be, forced her to live her life in a way that kind of fed their own dreams. She was a witness to some very horrific things as a child. And basically this left her with the emotional mentality of a 13 year old, according to the psychiatrist. So because of this, they did not believe that when she killed Peter or, you know, maybe didn't do what she needed to to help him. I'm still not sure of exactly what happened. That basically she didn't understand what she was doing to Peter and she didn't understand why she did it and that it was bad. However, despite this analysis from the psychiatrist, the jury pretty much had had enough because for someone having the emotional mentality of a 13 year old, she also seemed highly intelligent through all of her trials. She was clearly emotionally stable enough to manipulate individuals for her own gain and for her family's gain. I mean, they did a whole bunch of digging and were able to for sure find out that Mr. White, this man that she claimed she was married to, did not exist and had never existed. She created him to help her get out of numerous, very difficult scenarios. She used the death of her made up husband to lure in John for reasons that I don't think anyone will fully ever understand. She lied to the community her whole entire life to support her family's lavish lifestyle. She managed to lead authorities on a wild goose chase on purpose to shake them off of her trail. And ultimately she lied about giving her son to a local agency for adoption because she claimed she couldn't take care of another child because her husband that didn't actually exist wasn't there to help her. And I just personally don't know enough about the evaluation that was done on her by the psychiatrist. I personally don't know enough about the whole situation to form my own opinion. Um, fully, but I do feel like maybe emotionally she wasn't understanding some things, but she was very well aware of her own actions and she thought them all out very well. She planned things, everything seemed very premeditated. I understand how the jury ended up coming to this conclusion. She was a danger regardless of what sort of mental age she was at. She was a danger to those around her and she did not need to be given the option of continuing to endanger and manipulate people. So Evelyn ended up being found guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. So Bill completely got off. Um, Donald only got five years and Evelyn was sentenced to life in prison. And by 1958, so not too long, like literally like 10 years after all of this happened, 
Evelyn ended up being paroled, so she didn't even serve that much time. She was handed a new name by authorities and the government. She was given a new location to live. And the only people aware of where she was and what her new name was, was the parole board and um, local police. So she did, in fact, after being paroled, uh, she was having to check in with the parole board all the time, pretty much consistently for the next 30 years of her life. She was very highly monitored from my understanding so that she could not harm anybody else. And in 1985, after these 30 years passed, she was granted pardon under the Royal Prerogative of Mercy. So she basically had been on well enough behavior while paroled for long enough to where they didn't believe she was a threat any longer. And she was from that point on a totally free woman. So we already discussed that she would have been um, 100 years old at this point in time. So she's likely no longer alive, but I don't think anyone to this day knows what her name was changed to, where she ended up, um, you know, whether she managed to contact her family again, her dad that had gotten out of prison in only five years and five years prior to when she got out. You know, I don't know if she got in contact with her mother. She did have Heather still, so I don't know if she got in contact with her daughter. But it's very possible that she just slipped back into society and created a new family because she would have only been in her 30s at this point and no one would have known the difference. And she could have like a whole line of individuals that either know who she was and haven't said anything or just are related to this woman and have absolutely no idea. To this day, probably the one thing that sticks out, obviously most in all of this, is that not a single person ended up being sentenced for this ridiculously brutal murder of John Dick. Like this poor man that was trying to live his life and help someone that appeared to be in need, which in reality was just manipulation. They weren't actually able to successfully charge anyone with anything, especially because obviously she had been found not guilty um, at her second trial in regards to the murder of John Dick. Uh, but I don't know if I believe that Donald was the one that acted alone, but I'll obviously speak more on that in a moment. His great niece uh, was kind enough to send me an email and she is diving headfirst into the case and has been for the past two years, I believe. She hopes to work in criminal justice herself and she said it's just very interesting to hear all the history of her family and learn things that she hadn't known otherwise and how crazy this case absolutely is. And she said that people are still very divided to this day about what may have happened and if Evelyn actually did play any part in the murder of John. There are tons of people that believe that she absolutely was the one who murdered her husband or at least hired someone to do it for her, but there are so many people that believe that she was not involved at all. She was a bad person, but she wasn't involved. It just makes me really sad for their family because I can totally see the hype that was around the case and how this was just so bewildering to people. And we're a very curious, you know, people, we're very curious people by nature. And it's interesting to see something different that you wouldn't expect. And while I totally understand that and think that's something that just n comes naturally, that's also something that I feel like people need to keep in check and also understand that there are victims underneath things like this and there are real people that are being affected. It was just kind of baffling to me to have this realization that I, was able to say so much about Evelyn and her family. There's just endless information about every nook and cranny of their life out there. But like the little tiny blurb of John and just that he was from Russia and he came over here with his family in the 20s and then eventually settled in Hamilton and then was a conductor at the railway station. Like that's pretty much all you can find of him online. I don't know how his family felt during all these trials. I can only imagine what it was like watching three individuals, including, well, especially Evelyn, kind of like smile and smirk her way through it as if it was a big joke. Um, you just see nothing really on how they felt, what they may have been going through, who supported them during all of this. I mean, imagine going to the courthouse 
because your son has been murdered and there's just like fanboys everywhere and fangirls everywhere just like drooling over the person that's been accused of killing your son. I can't imagine. It just reminds me so much of Ted Bundy and makes me so incredibly uncomfortable and I just wish there was more information out there and I'm still in the process of speaking with his great niece and I'm hoping she can give me more information on John um, and just other things about this case. I know she has a lot of the different transcripts still from the trial that I would love to read over. As I said, there are many people that believe many things when it comes to what exactly happened to John. Um, I personally believe that if Evelyn did not kill John herself, that she was still absolutely involved in some way, shape, or form. While some believe it was more likely jealous suitors that could have easily been to blame for this murder, I just think that her behavior says it all when it comes to her and you really can't pass up the fact that these bones and teeth um you know all of this evidence that was found in evelyn and donald's home you can't pass that up and i know that forensic testing was not the same then as it was today but they felt confident enough then and i really wish like there was some way to test any evidence now that there may have been. Granted, everyone at this point, for the most part, is no longer around, so it wouldn't make a huge difference in regards of charging someone, but it may give family that's still looking into this some bit of peace. My camera just entirely died, and that has never happened before while filming a video, so I can only imagine how long this is going to be, but to go where I was just at, to keep going, um, as I said, I don't think, if Evelyn didn't kill John herself, I believe in my personal opinion that she at least likely knew about it or was involved in some way. I think it's possible that Donald really wanted him gone simply because of the fact that he had blackmailed him. John was threatening to take away the one thing that he seemed to care about in life. Um, if you think about their history, the only thing they managed to go and strive towards was being seen as a wealthy, well-known family. The threat of taking that away when that seemed to be the one thing he cared about could have been kind of what snapped him. However, with that being said, I would not put it past Evelyn to at least help lure John in, or at the very least, she wasn't against the idea. But in the same breath, now that I'm thinking about it, I could see Donald acting on his own because he easily could have. He could have reached out to John and been like, look, I've changed my mind, let's talk about this. And then things went from there. But I do think even if he did act on his own, Evelyn eventually knew about it and helped to protect him. Because if you think about all of her stories and all she had known all of her life, it was about protecting, um, her father. It was about protecting her family, her mother, and doing whatever her parents told her to do. That is all she knew. And if her father asked her to shake the police off of his trail, I do not doubt at all that she would have done it. But also knowing that she was able to do what she did to her son, I just don't put anything past anyone. So I can see why there is kind of a lot of back and forth on who people believe was potentially actually responsible for this. I just ultimately wish that John's family would have been able to have some sort of answers and in turn a bit more closure. He, from what I've seen, seemed like a great person. He seemed like a very caring person. He fought for things that he loved and seeing that someone so manipulative took that away and took him away from the world is heartbreaking. And just knowing what came out of that, how sensationalized the case was and how far it distracted people off of course when it comes to John is just devastating. But that's all that I have for you guys today. Thank you so much as always for taking the time out of your day to listen to John Dick's story. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys on my next video. Bye. Thank you.